Hey everybody, uh, so I'm Francis and thank you for joining my session and choosing this one. I hope it's really useful. I'm going to give a presentation for about 20 minutes just sort of talking about the problems around the high street, like the structural problems and then a few good sort of good news stories and then what I'd really like is for, you know, questions um, but also for you to share your experiences as well of what's happening in your places and what you're up to on your high street so we can all learn from each other. So. Um, yeah, so my name is Francis. I work at the New Economics Foundation in London, but I, uh, I've only worked there for a few years, and mostly I got that job because of my experience working in places, um, doing community development and figuring out where, um, where the problems were around how to do, like, meet community needs properly. So as well as, um, as, well as working at the New Economics Foundation, I also advise a group in Bradford who we're looking, who I'll talk about later, we're looking at bringing several different buildings in the centre into community ownership. And I live in Totnes in Devon, where I'm director of a community development society. So the problems that are on high streets are kind of, they're the ones that lie beneath what you actually see, I think. And I, I, I imagine that many of you know your places really well, so you'll understand what they are. But structurally, the issue is that it looks like they're just closed shops and that's just the way it is. And, you know, online retail and out-of-town shopping centres and that's why they're closed. But in fact, they've been closed for a long time for lots of different reasons in many places. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the people who own them. So the people who own them don't always have the, the best interests of the place at heart. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're local landlords, sometimes they're good landlords, but on the whole, uh, a lot of landlords actually just own lots of different properties in lots of different places. They don't even know where they own those properties. And so they hold them in what's called a book value. And so this is what leads to the, the gulf between what communities need and what landlords and landowners actually you know, want for themselves or need for themselves. Very, very different intentions and needs. So the, the problem is that over 50% are owned by corporate and overseas investors. So this idea of having a book value, what they do is they buy, you know, a huge swathe of property and then they, they have that, that value that they can borrow against to buy more property. And the money that they're getting from rents is the money that, shows whether that, that book value is worth as much as it is or whether it's less or higher. And so in places where rents have gone down over time, they don't let those buildings because they don't want to show on the book value that the rent has gone down and the income is less into their, book, into their portfolio. And so it's actually more beneficial for them to keep them empty financially than it is to let people try them out, you know, kind of have, have a kind of meanwhile space or to rent them at the actual value, the, the rents that there are locally. And also we, over time we've had the real problem with, you know, local authorities having to sell land, particularly in the last 10 years, with the austerity cuts, they've started to just sell property um, to uh, meet their, their funding gap, or they also are charging similar rents to the landlords, so they're much higher rents than people can afford. And so a lot of my work is around putting local people in charge of property. So I've been working with Power to Change, who are a funder that some of you might know about, or probably being um, funded by, looking at this very specific issue, which is with this platform um, project that we're working on at the moment. And it's basically saying, OK, in your place, who is sitting on that property? Who is sitting on that shop that you want to take over or that empty building that's been empty for a long time? And so what people are starting to do is start to look at having like community land registries. So you have a, a, basically a map of all the retail and commercial space. And then you start to be able to say, well, we know what the history of that building is. We know that that's the person who owns it. We know it changed hands 12 times in the last 10 years. We know that it's been empty for X amount of time. So really fundamentally understanding what happens in the market is really important. And key to that as well is understanding who the local agents are because often estate agents or surveyors are the people who keep that property away from local people because they act on behalf of the landlord. And if they say to the landlord, oh, I don't think they can afford it or, you know, I, I think that, you know, they'll only been there for a short period of time, then their landlord takes that advice, which means that it's still, you know, kind of withheld from communities. And so we need to have this 
um, transition to kind of this idea of space as service. So that's buildings, but also land and uh, spaces and parks and that kind of thing. And this is the work that I know you're all doing. So it's kind of building on that. And, and one of the examples I'm going to talk about in Bradford is where they are um, seeing the um, property across the town centre as basically a constellation. So instead of just thinking about one empty shop or one build, civic building that's not, that's not being used, it's kind of saying, right, which are the buildings that are in public ownership? Which are the ones that are in community ownership? And that might be through a local charity or it might be through, like in Bradford, there's a Mechanics Institute library. So that's owned by its members. It's pretty much community ownership. So thinking about what's that constellation so that if the public sector work together with the community sector, then you start to say to the private landlords, well, this is how we behave, this is how we let our space, this is how we expect you to behave as well, and this is how you can be part of this much more uh, restorative and um, sustainable use of space and generative use of space. And so I'm just going to talk through three examples of places where they've set up community trust to do that. So the first one is in Tottenham in London uh, at Walls Corner. I don't know, does anybody know Tottenham? Yeah, a few people. Great. So um, this is a, a building that was a department store back in uh, the 20s and 30s. It was like the Selfridges of North London. And it closed in the 50s. Um, that's what it looked like inside, very beautiful. Um, and then it closed in the 50s, and this is what it looked like in the 70s. Uh, Transport for London basically bought the building so that they could um, redevelop uh, Seven Sisters Railway tube station underneath. And so it's been kept empty um, for about 50 years on the corner building. But the building that you see there with the houses um, above it, um, and, and sort of in the middle of it, which is still part of, the, some of it's the part of the department store, somebody in the 80s turned it into a market. And so for the last, um, however long 81 was, 40 years, <laughs> losing track of time, uh, then it's been this really amazing community market. Um, and over time, it's called the Seven Sisters Indoor Market, but over time it's been um, predominantly Latin American traders that have been trading from there. So it's done out inside like a Latin village, Publita Paisa is what, um, what is known as uh, locally. And so you can see that the department store uh, cornices and all the lovely sort of 20s architecture is still there in the corner, but then the traders have built each of their stalls up with mezzanines and they've put verandas in and, you know, made it look like the Latin village. And it's a place where just people are there all the time. So in the daytime, it's a place of different uh, supermarkets and cafes and uh, beauty salons. It's also where people go to when they, they come here from Latin America and they need to find other people that they can uh, speak to and understand how to you know, exchange money and get lawyers to deal with their residency applications and that kind of thing. And so it's a real home for the Latin American community, but also for the people who live around it. And so in the evenings, there is music and dancing in and out of the shops. Um, and about 20 years ago, this was part of a development plan in Haringey, and the developer, Granger, were going to come along and um, they were going to demolish that market and they were going to put in this redevelopment, which would have been all um, built to rent flats with no affordable rent flats. And I don't know if you can see that, but everybody needs a pastor express in their lives, I feel. We're missing out on, uh, on not having that. Um, and so the community came together and have campaigned over the last 20 years and this year Granger, the developer, pulled out. Uh, and this development trust, which is a, com a community benefit society, as are all the trusts that I'm talking about today, so effectively a cooperative structure. It's a really interesting way of holding buildings in uh, uh, democratic ownership but also able to raise community shares. We're established to... Um, to not just regenerate that building, but also think about how they could regenerate the whole area and put the money from that back into uh, buying more buildings and then making a sort of self-perpetuating uh, circle. Um, so that's how the building still is upstairs, so it's still pretty intact. And this is the community plan for the building, so currently we're, um, we're raising funds to develop that building and Harringay Council is supportive, and so are Transport for London who own the building. Um, the second one uh, I want to talk about is Nudge Community Builders. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. They're at Union Street in Plymouth. They're really worth looking up. So they emerged about 15 years ago out of a, a 
a residence action group called Stonehouse Action. So this is part Union Street in Plymouth is part of um, the, the kind of bit of the city that goes from the, the city centre down to the port. And so it's where all the bars were and all the pubs and all the theatres, where all the sailors came when they were on shore leave. And it was like, you know, until probably about 10 years ago, it was where all the nightclubs were and it was just where everybody went out to have a good time. But it's really uh, been in decline. So what the community did was they started by having street parties and then they uh, took over a, a building on a meanwhile uh, lease from a local landlord to create Union Corner and that's where people can still use it and, and as a community hub. But then they thought, well, okay, so we're doing that, but what's happening now is that the landlords are starting to see that we're bringing attention to the street and they're all starting to sort of see what the potential is for them to make money from it, so we need to start buying the buildings ourselves. So that's why they formed Nudge Community Builders. And so that's one of the old theatres, which is kind of falling into uh, significant disrepair that you can just see behind it, but some beautiful buildings on the street, heritage buildings. And... So what they did was they bought the Clipper, which was a 24-hour pub, um, and they turned it into a, uh, like a, a cafe and a market where people can come and trade and, and try out their, their new business ideas, but also uh, you know, gather and, and still chat and be friends. Uh, that's the painting on the wall there that was originally in the pub. They've tried to keep it you know, relatively sympathetic. And above it, there's two flats. Uh, that they managed themselves, and that was to plug a gap for, specifically for people who were estranged from their partners and couldn't have their children to come and stay because they didn't have a spare room. And so those flats are specifically for single parents who want their children to be able to come and stay. And then uh, they've taken on the plot, which is a, on a long-term lease from a local landlord, and they've turned it into a sort of health and well-being uh, sort of um, experiment, sort of, you know, um, space where people can come and test their ideas for uh, different innovations. And it, it was open completely throughout the pandemic. When they first took it, that whole room was just filled with furniture to the, like, to the ceiling. So they, you know, local people came together, they helped them clear it out. There was a lot of rats. Um, and then they've turned it into this incredible space and they've put in these greenhouses where people can kind of gather and, and sort of talk through their ideas. And also these sheds, you can't really see them on the left-hand side. There's various sheds where different people are trying out different ideas. Um, and now, because they're <laughs> acquisitional, uh, they've taken on this building, which is right at the front of the start of Union Street, basically the sort of gateway to the city. And it used to be an Odeon um, uh, theatre, and that's what it looked like in its heyday back in the 50s, and that's what it looks like at the moment. And it um, has been a, it was a nightclub until about six years ago, so it's you know it's been sort of adapted, shall we say, over time. But so it needs a significant amount of work. But they've just bought that um, in partnership with a silent investor, and uh, they're starting to use it for meanwhile spaces. This is a local band, and then they effectively that's what they'll do until they start to completely renovate it for arts and culture use. And so the final example I wanted to give was about the people's property portfolio in Bradford. So this was two women in Bradford who went to see Wendy and Hannah who run Nudge Community Builders in Plymouth just before the lockdown and were really inspired by what they were doing and thought we could do that in Bradford City Centre as well because it's pretty much empty at the moment. There's very, very little use in, in the city centre. But there is um, investment from the city council and they've, t they've taken down some sort of old sort of newish buildings and they're building a new market. So it's like, how can we try to make sure that the uplifting value doesn't um, mean that the community can't actually own and, and operate buildings um, alongside that? And so um, they, this is one of the buildings that's been pulled down, but it was a meanwhile space of an old Marks and Spencers called the Wild Woods, they're an arts and culture organisation. Um, and so they, they ran this, uh, they created a space where it was all just basically like a, a, a bit like here, you know, like a, a sort of wild woods where people came and performed, did all kinds of different things. And, um, and then they took on uh, a lease for a, a local pub, which was also a pub of uh, quite ill repute in Bradford called the Old Crown. But now they've got their eye on this um, building here at the back. So you can see where they're tearing down the old Max and Spencer's. And they, um, they've got their eye on that building behind called Vintry House so that they can turn that into an arts and culture space, but also then buy up other buildings. So they also want to establish a trust 
which effectively acts like a bit of a, what they're calling a people's land bank. So this is Bradford city centre, and where the, where the sort of the light green is, Darley Street, but that's where the new market will be. Vintry House is just behind it in the yellow. And so the idea being that you have this constellation across the city centre of publicly owned buildings, because Bradford Council does still own quite a lot of buildings, and then bring a, a, quite a, a few more into community ownership and then create the footfall across the city centre, which means that people are sort of, you know, travelling around, they're seeing different things and they're using the city centre in a different way, but the, the wealth is being locked back into the community because... Um, the money that's generated through those buildings goes back either through the council into their services or through the community trust. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of uh, the proposition from the platform work that we're doing with Power to Change is that if we are you know, serious about community zoning and, and leading transformation of, of high streets, then this is how they will become. And so um, I'm just gonna leave you with Vicky Alvarez, who's a trader at Latin Village, this was a quote from her, which this is a world's corner building with all the, you know, the thousand flowers blooming out of it. And this is a quote from her, which, um, yeah, knowing that she's been involved in a battle for 20 years to save the building feels like pretty emotional. So, um, yeah, so I suppose if we just open for questions anybody's got or if there's something that you want to say that you're involved in yourselves that you want to share with people, that would be great. Uh, and maybe if you say who you are and where you're from at the start before you speak, that would be lovely. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. It was really interesting. Um, I, I'm Joe. I'm from a, a big world that's in Western Superman in Somerset. Somerset. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and um, I'd, I'd, I'd love all this, and we've got sort of, uh, sort of similar sort of initiatives around our area. Money is more sort of culturally themed, and not so much more place making. But I would love that to be more place making. But how do you how do you raise the money to get these buildings and keep that going? That's that's what we struggle with because I'm also involved in another building which is called Art Space, and it's sort of a, a hub for artists. And we got given that by a company called Terrestrial. They came into town for a year, then they left. And they left the legacy of the hub, and we've got a free rent. It's also part of the Meanwhile Foundation as well. Yeah. But the, the, gov the council, we're the only one using it, so they might get rid of it because we're the only ones. And we're struggling to sort of keep it a free space for artists to come in, but we haven't got any sort of... We don't want to charge because that just goes against our value as a space. So, And funding's hard, <laughs> as you know. So how do you just keep generating the money? Yeah, it's difficult without charging rent. Yeah. I mean, becoming a, <laughs> a landlord yourself, really. Um, I suppose the one thing that I would say about that is um, funding is hard to come by, but I guess if the artists... I mean, are, are all the artists, like, social enterprises or some of them...? See, uh, it, it ranges from being sort of amateur to sort of, yeah, enterprising. So it, that's why it wanted that sort of in-between space between you can enjoy your work and come to a space well-known, and then if you are enterprising, you want to sell stuff, then you can go on to the next sort of space, which is a place called The Stables, and you can charge. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a real sort of little gap. Yeah. yeah. And is there collaboration between the artists about sort of putting in funding for a particular project? Or? Well, we're going to have a big old meeting in a few weeks. Obviously, COVID has really sort of crushed that quite a bit. So we're just trying to generate that community feel again, and it's slowly getting busier and busier. So hopefully we'll see what we can do about that next week. But yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, because free spaces are important, aren't they? I think it's, it's knowing, like, your building and how much it costs to operate, mm. obviously, and making it as sort of insulated as possible. Yeah. So if you can get grants, for, there's different grants for different things, so if you can secure the building. Uh, do you have the freehold for the building? Or a long no, lease? No, it's, it's the council. It's a year lease again. It's only year by year, which is really annoying. Yeah, but it's, but it's pepper, you don't pay them for the lease. No, no, we, d we just pay for our electric and gas and whatever it is, the utilities. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, it is. There's so much different nuance between the different things, isn't there? But I, I think it is the sort of funding between the, mm. the people who are using it to sort of try and bring it. I suppose it's just project funding, but then you bring your core costs in for the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, I know the actor. different in uh, different areas because like where I am uh, 
properties at a premium, uh, you know, they spot a blade of grass, they want to put a shower block on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was looking there at, at, at Tottenham, and that must have been very difficult because uh, <laughs> property around there is expensive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we, we're going after to rent a place, and we, we've got charitable status, and uh, we're going to have to go in at the top right just to compete. Yeah. You know, it's really difficult. But, like, Bradford, you, 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 you've got lower sort of property prices, haven't you? You know, so it must be easier in up north, you know, than it is down south. So it must... Where did you say you was from? Somerset. Somerset, where it's got to be not too bad down there, has it, compared to London and places like that? I'll do my best. Now, it's now a commuter town with Bristol, so the prices are slowly rising all around. Yeah, the yeah. But yeah. As, as you'll, you'll probably know, prices are rising everywhere property-wise, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Whereabouts are you in London? Uh, I'm uh, from Boreham Wood, which is uh, Denial Street. Not so much, but I know where You know, EastEnders and Strictly and all that. That's yeah. all made in Boreham Wood. Yeah. You know, so we're right on the outskirts of London. Um, they're building a thing called the L Street Corridor. And out of the whole of Hertfordshire, we're getting all the houses. Not uh, mm -hmm. social housing. It's they, they call it affordable housing, but it, it, it depends what sort of money you've got whether you can afford some it, isn't it? Uh, it? It's all for... And they just sit there. They, they, they've built loads of them before. They just sit there, you know just waiting for people to pay ridiculous money and then half the time they sit empty, you know, crazy. Yeah. yeah. What's your relationship like with the council? Not very good. But all they, all, you know, it, it, if you go with, them with a brown paper bag full of money, you, you get on fine with them, you know, <laughs> because they're, they're being uh, looked into and, Are they? you know, everything else. It's one of the richest uh, councils uh, in that area, you know. We vote to the MP... Uh, Oliver Dowden, and uh, he's just with them, you know. <laughs> You're lucky if you get an answer, yeah. Yeah, because in those places it is, I mean, definitely with um, with Tottenham, it was having the council, I mean, they didn't back, they didn't yeah. back the community plan for a long time, but until Granger pulled out, um, and there was a change of leadership. Um, but they have been really supportive, and sometimes I think when you have relationships with council, sometimes it's maybe leveraging them a bit more. So it's maybe it's worth saying thanks for the free rent, but actually we need security, we need a longer lease. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a locality do really good advice on that, but just kind of holding their feet to the fire a little bit on that because there are there are loads of models for that elsewhere that you could sort of give them the confidence to do that. So I, I, I mean, I know councils are really tricky, um, but the the more, yeah, it's kind of like a carrot and stick thing, really, isn't it? But if they won't talk to you at all, then that's yeah, or they're just corrupt, then yeah, that's a real problem. Yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm also from Hertfordshire. We're from Wormley and Turnford, um, close to Enfield. And there are two big local areas in Hertfordshire. One of them is in Boremut and the other one is, is ours. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a question and a comment, really. Um, so we are in an area in the middle of the uh, borough of Broxbourne. Uh, it has a number of towns, um, you know, Hoddesdon, for example, Wovham Cross, with quite a thriving high, high street. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, in our case, there isn't an infrastructure like a central meeting point for local residents. Yeah. And it really um, is an issue in many ways uh, because there isn't this central meeting point. It means that very often our area is defined as, as an area with pockets of communities. Um, and the, the high street itself is quite small. Um, and again, it will be quite difficult looking at your really nice and visual presentation to bring uh, you know a higher a number of people into the high street because the high street really is is quite small. Um, so, what would you suggest would be the best way to use the high street with its limitations uh, in order to create some sort of an engagement with residents and local businesses? We've tried to do a number of things, uh, and again, you know, um, not all of them uh, you know have worked. Um, and the second question, maybe it's not a question, maybe a comment, and and I'm almost kind of responding to my own question is that we've. We've recently signed a lease on a community center, and the community center is very close to the high street. Mm. It is absolutely a fantastic building with a huge potential, and we will be investing heavily in the building. Um, and this will become a legacy of the project, and in a way also 
a hub for the community. However, the high street really uh, always provides an opportunity to bring also different people together as well, which again, you know, a uh, community center might not. Yeah, how, how big is the town center? I mean, shop, is it like a parade of shops or? Yeah, few few shops on the high street really. Um, not not many. It's not, I wouldn't even call it a parade. Brigitte, okay. what do you think? <laughs> a a, a betting shop, fish shop, and a corner shop. That's it. <laughs> and there are two towns in the area. One one called Wormley, and the other one called Terenford, and the other one doesn't even have a high street. Okay. Um, so again, this is, for example, uh, one of the reasons why this area was selected. Uh, because again, as I said, you know, there are many other areas across the county, but again, there is no uh, infrastructure centrally uh, which brings people together, which definitely has been an issue for us in many ways in terms of engaging different parts of the community. Yeah, so what did you say? There's a betting shop, a chip shop? News agent, and a, news uh, agent. a barber, which I use very often, obviously, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Take away. Um, so, I mean, have those businesses been there a long time? Is, is it like a William Hills or a... Yeah. Um, and are the other shops, like community, or, you know, sort of local businesses? Yes, been there a long time. Been there a long time. Uh, do, and do you know... How likely is it that the William Hills will stay? I only ask because they've been pulling out of quite a few different places. Well, Labbrook's on Because in some ways, if it, if it works, you know, for Pete, apart from the betting shop, I used to work in William Mills, that's why I'm asking, really. They, they don't really work for high streets. Um, but I, I think if it, if it kind of works, then it's sort of how do you connect the community centre to it? And so I, I'm a trustee of a community centre in Totnes, where I live, and, like, it's actually on the high street, but we, we sort of we talk to the local businesses quite a lot, and so we sort of bring them in to do things and then we promote what they're doing as well uh, so I don't know like a fish and chip supper you know that kind of thing or you know like like, like barbers going to pubs now and stuff don't they it's like a thing so like maybe they want to you know come and do something in the community centre I think that's how and, and then I'd keep an eye on that betting shop because if you find out who owns it actually getting that betting shop into a, a community use would be great wouldn't it because then you'd have something in the heart of the high street that's actually good for the local area where the money's not just flowing straight out yeah that would be my yeah thinking does anybody have an example of a building you know like your example was great but any other examples of buildings that they've got their eye on or they're managing or Hello there. Uh, my name's Annie and I'm from Ramsey Big Local. We had a dying high street, um, although it wasn't as bad as some other areas in the country. Um, we're one of the first tranche of Big Local, so we've been looking at this problem now for eight years. I think we finally cracked it. Uh, it's only taken eight years. Not long, not long. Um, but we, we thought, what have we got? And we think well, we've got no A roads, we've got no big businesses we've got no big anything we have a multitude multiplicity of small halls that can only be used for certain things so um we commissioned a survey of local spaces to see what people wanted what they wanted to use them for and what we had how much it cost and what size they were the result of that was that none of the spaces actually suited the majority of people in the community you know we've got sort of couple of Baptist church and a Methodist church and you can't have raffles and you can't have alcohol so that puts them out for a lot of things um, we have a community centre which is quite new and it was section 106 money and it is two enormous rooms with no proper soundproofing in them and that's it so it's great for a big event it's not great for anything else because you can't let out it you can't let it out as two separate places so we had a good look, and um, the results were that we could either build onto the community centre, which would have meant we lost all the outside space. We could have 
tried to persuade the district council to give us a patch of land in the centre of town, but they wanted to sell it and sell it to us for 600,000. And we're thinking, no. Um, and then the cricket club said, well, we've got a pavilion. You use it anyway for your kids' clubs, so why don't we alter it? So we've gone in, entered into a joint venture agreement with the cricket club, and we are currently in the throes of building a community hub mm -hmm. by extending, well, it was extending till it fell down and we had to start again. So we are building a brand new <laughs> community hub uh, at the cricket club. Um, which will be used, it's been designed specifically to be multi-use, multi-purpose. But trying to tie into the high street is, is not so easy because it's quite away from the high street. Um, and people were saying they want to drop in cafe, which we have several of, but you can only get one buggy in. You know, if two young mums want to meet, that's it. No one else can go in because there's simply not room. Um, so in order to sort of placate the high street in a way, we looked at other things and we thought, what have we got? Well, we've got quite a lot of heritage. Mm. So we've been doing heritage days and tying all the heritage sites up together and pulling people in. Now we've added an artisan market to a heritage day, which pulls people into the centre of town. Now, they wouldn't open at first, the shops, but now quite a few of them open and engage and join in. Um, we've got a Halloween event today um, so we've given all the shops an opportunity to have a trick-or-treat bucket, which we supply. So that pulls people into the shops so the kids want to go get their trick-and-treat. And we're actually getting much better buy-in, aren't we? But the market has been useful because we've had two stall holders have now taken shops because they started with the market stall. They found that they were successful enough to start to pay some rent. They've got a couple of the landlords persuaded to pay a reasonable rent. So we're actually, with the drip-drip technique, getting on better. Yeah. But COVID-19 has actually helped us in a way because we were the recognised um, local COVID organisation for the council, and they've suddenly seen us. So they're now throwing money at us for this, that and the other, and we're getting a parklet, whatever that is. It's seats with bushes in, I think, in the middle of the high street, but whatever, um, and bright blue. Um, and uh, we've been invited along to be part of their economic development for the district council. So suddenly from nowhere, yeah. we're actually getting somewhere. So what I say to you all is don't despair, be patient, hang on in there, and if you can't, Change if you can't. If the council won't change, change the council. We infil infiltrated about seven people into the council <laughs> locally now, so it's much better. It works in our favour because they're all members of something that we do. Um, but getting to work with councils is the most frustrating thing I think I've ever had to do. And bearing in mind I used to work there, um, it's impossible. I have to use personal contacts to get anything done. Yeah. So. Hang on in there and see if you can find a back door way of doing something or think outside the box, go for a different building, go for something outrageous. Just suck it and see. So no question really, just no, a comment. <laughs> Thank you. I can ask a question and I'll sit here and talk to you all day if you like, but you'll be <laughs> bored to death. Who wants this now? <laughs> Don't take my toy away, I want it. I can speak. <laughs> So how many high, how many shops are on your high street? Would you say? Thirty. Sorry. Yeah, we do for the live. Well, we've uh, our high street isn't called high street. Our high street is the one that's only got it's got one to about five restaurants and about four or five other things in it. Five things in it. But Great White, which is a road that has a sort of a side road, we have a dual road, which is great because we can actually close off a whole mm. strip of it and not shut the road because we have the market charter, funnily enough. Um, and I suppose there's, what's it, how many do you reckon? 30? About 30 shops. Um, and we're gradually trying to stop the estate agents because we have about four which isn't bad for 8,000 houses. Um, we're trying not to have nail salons and, and that sort of a thing, but they have closed all our banks except one. Um, but we're taking... The buildings have become an indoor market, nothing to do with us, please. 
Um, one of them is going to become housing and accommodation and the other one's going to be the new council offices for the town council. So actually the high street is now drawing more things into it instead of chucking them out. Well, not the high street, Great White. It just kind of goes round the corner at the top. Mm. So, yeah. No, that's interesting. So high streets are sort of changing in the way that, you know, thinking about that, how you link a community centre with the high street yeah. and how people perceive a high street in a different kind of way, isn't it, I guess? Well, it's an awful lot busier now than it ever was. I mean, I couldn't park the other day, for heaven's sake. I mean, it just wasn't good enough. <laughs> Does anybody else, because markets are also really interesting, just that, that example of um, Latin Village in Tottenham, that that was a completely empty building but became this incredible thriving hub because somebody just decided that they were going to you know, take a lease and open a market. But I wonder, does, does, has anybody else set up a market through their big local? Hi, yeah, I'm Carl from Archers Local. I'm just, just a no point. Um, yeah, Dover done a similar thing, took an old co op store um, and basically made it a venue for new startups to try stuff. So you can rent a space per square of per tile space uh, and they provided the internet and all sorts of other things. It's been going for about four years. I don't know how long it's got to last because the redevelopers want to redevelop it. Yeah. So that's that's worked quite well in Dover. Um, I'm not in Dover. Hey. But that was in Dover. Yeah, that was in Dover. Yeah. Right. And is it still it's still going? Well, I'm not sure if it's still going. I mean, I'm surprised they weren't up here actually. Um, but it it was very successful what what it did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hang on. Thank you. Yeah, don't don't you think a lot of this is of our own making? All these empty shops in the high street, because you know when they do go, people say, "Oh, you so love that shop. You used to shop there." But now everybody, they don't go to the shops even when they're there and open. You know, how many people here got their last thing from Amazon? And it's all done online now, isn't it? So we're not actually using those shops in the high street because it's more convenient, isn't it, to go to Amazon or wherever, you know, online. I think that's where, I think that's where the diversity <laughs> Sorry, because we're live casting out to yeah, people. Yeah, sure. I think that's where where the diversity, and like you're saying about the um, the markets, the artisan markets and craft places and all that kind of thing, because those kind of things you can't get online, and they're more they are more local, aren't they? And that's that's where the target market is, isn't it? Where mm. if you want that to thrive, you've got to look at local or you know, even if it's a 10-mile radius out uh, of people doing specific things, like, you know, um, where you get these farmers and now and they're doing all their specialist sausages or stuff like that. You've got to look at, instead of looking at what used to be good and used to sell in the shop, that doesn't sell anymore, that's all online, isn't it? And I think that's where COVID's come in. But when you get the, like say, the markets, they work... Is that for a specific community, aren't they? It's a classic example with a, it's a classic example with the banks, isn't it? You know, they're closing the banks because everybody's doing online banking now. You know? mm, that, there's quite a lot of research showing that that's yeah. a little bit chicken and egg. Like people yeah. were forced to do online yeah. banking, and yeah. then actually they yeah. said, "Oh, sorry, we don't." There's a really good report I could yeah. <laughs> send out on that. Yeah. So I think some of it is that I think companies use that as an excuse. But actually, they just don't want to pay the rents anymore because they realise that they don't have to. So they're sort of, you know, sort of pulling out that way. Going on this sort of conversation, conversation here, do you think people are maybe more looking for experiences these days instead of, like I say, shops, as it were, just basic needs? Because the markets, I guess that's a certain experience of interacting and also the, uh, 
the spaces they've got. Would you say that's a right thing for high streets to go now? Because obviously, like, like I said, it's all online. So I think a la high street again, we've, we've lost a massive Marks and Spencers and that's and people are like, oh, I'm never going there again. Oh, it's awful. And it's like, there's so many other shops. Like, it's only Marks and bloody Spencers. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> My mother-in-law's like... <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, I, I think that's a bit dangerous as well, the experience thing. I think... We, we've done some research on markets, like traditional retail markets, how important they are, like, for meeting people's needs. And, of course, you've got, like, B&M Bargains and, you know, those kinds of shops that are in Lidl and Aldi, and, and that's all fine. But I, I do think a nice balance on high streets where people can still go and buy things that meet their, you know, that they can afford and that can meet their needs, combined with places to meet and shop and, you know, sort of for those more basic things is important. I'm thinking about... Cause Totnes High Street, where I am, is very, it's particularly since the pandemic, like so many people visiting from, you know, because of the staycation thing. And most of the shops now have become like, you know, gift shops and all that kind of thing. And there's butchers that we've still got, but only because they own their building and they've just got really good trade. Um, and so, you know, the, the spaces in between, which are like the community centres, the church halls, you know, the sort of markets and things are really important to that. And they're not just experiences. I think they are places where people go to get what they need yeah. as well. Um, yeah, and experiences always make me, makes me think about, like, maybe imagine you virtually on an app. <laughs> you know, like yeah, that kind of thing that New Look now do, apparently, where you can sort of see yourself, what you're wearing in a mirror, but not wearing it, yeah. which is fine. Mm -hmm. Like, that's good. But people do actually want to try stuff on, I think, as well. Yeah. Can I also ask, because... Um, I'm speaking about my high street as in my town, but mm. I, when it comes to big local, are, are we're not in the town, we're in the suburbs. Mm. And we are in a line of free shops where our hub is, and then there's a, there's a Martins, and then there's a Chinese, which is just closed down, actually. Mm. And then the rest of our big local area is um, just lots of houses, lots of estates. And there's a park at one end, which has got another community sort of centre, but that's a different sort of business. And then... It's cut, also cut in half by a big old road. And then to the other side is a Sainsbury's and a home base, what was a home base, and a, an Audi. And it's got those states, but they're not in our area. Mm. So people don't really graduate towards, they graduate towards the home base and the other Sainsbury's. And then, because we're the suburb of a suburb, as it were, so our big local, again, doesn't actually go into Wirral High Street. So we're between two sort of high streets in a way, and we've only got a small line of shops. So I think we're really struggling to find a sort of a centre mm. of our area, especially again because it is cut again by this road. So I was interested in the sort of the constellations model of how they've got different places around the area. Yeah, mm. um, it makes me think. Of, I don't know how many people have heard him be inspired in Leicester, but that, that's a, a sixteen thousand people council estate in mm -hmm. Bronston that was built uh, basically in the garden of somebody who made pib props back in the twenties. Yeah. So it's still got this amazing park and a, a sort of house in the middle of it. But then all the land around it was this this housing estate, and they've got very few buildings. And so what Be Inspired have done is they've taken and they've still got other people who own like you know church halls and that kind of thing, but they've taken the the buildings that existed and they've repurposed them so there's like a, a thrift shop they've got the local leisure centre now and so they've used it to kind of generate income from one building to buy another building to bring that into community ownership there's like a business hub as well for new startups mm -hmm. and I mean that's a, that's a long established organisation but their model is a sound one and very often they get sort of asked to well maybe you should go into housing or, and they're like we could but actually we're really good at just doing the like community spaces like business you know kind of retail stuff and so that's a really good model to look at I think if, it's, if you're on an estate yeah. where there's just different sort of bits and what they've also done is they've been able to bring um, some I think there was like some flats where they've got the ground floor with a shop mm -hmm. in it yeah. because it's not flats it wasn't needed for flats anymore so it's kind of thinking just basically you have to wander around going I want that one that one that one and that one find out everything about it mm. and then try your best to get it yeah. and then worry about the money later <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody else with um, their own experience to talk about because it's really handy from Annie thank you where they are thank you Somerset. Um, 
our villages which we represent don't have a high street, obviously. But I'll come clean now. I am a district councillor on a <gasps> district in, in Somerset. And I have raised, through the committees I sit on, what is, this, what is the town's strategic plan for its development? Mm. I have had the meeting so far cancelled three times with no result. They have not come back to me yet with anything. No. I have got one more chance before I go public with it. But the other problem with it is they own the town to town shopping centre. Right. So they have a great conflict of interest. Because the conflict of interest is obviously they have the out of town shopping centre, which has free parking and also has, uh, is exceptionally busy, right. whereas the town centre is dying. I'm also trading in the town centre. So I can see what's happening firsthand, what's actually happening. One of our local, uh, shall I say, dignitaries said that the town centre is not high on the priorities to develop. So that's the problem. I would urge everybody here to get onto their councillors, get onto them and talk to them, and ask them to raise it at their committees as to what they are going to do with their high street. They should have a plan. Mm. I guarantee you that most of them haven't got one. They don't look at it. No. They don't think it's a priority. They might say, oh, we'll put a few benches in, or we'll put a few flowers in. That doesn't encourage people to come into the town centre. No. You've got to do things which is going to actually bring people in. You want the independents in there, independent traders who will, who will bring people in. If the shops are different, People will come in, the shop which we have is different, and we are comparatively busy still. But a lot of shops around us aren't, and they're closing. What is your business? It's a shop in a, a place called Angel Place in Bridgewater, and we trade in there. The, shop, the center itself, is, sorry, the center itself is 25% shut. 25% mm. of the units in the shop, in that unit, are shut. Yeah. We are successful only because we're different. Yeah. We are local traders, all doing local products. So people come in mm. to see us specifically. Mm. That's what's needed in the town centres. Yeah. And we have one end of the town, which is, shall we say, could do with a little bit of TLC. A lot of TLC. Uh, but they don't, they seem to, I, I can't explain, they just don't seem to, get the idea that something's got to be done because it will die. The centre will eventually just die and people just won't go there. Locals say they don't go into the centre because there's nothing there for them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's where fundamentally understanding who owns it and where the power lies is really important because you can go to the council and say, what's your plan? And this is what we did in Bradford. You can kind of say, you know, Bradford City Centre has been empty for as long as I can remember. I grew up there. Um, but when we went and said, right, okay, so now we know who owns all the buildings, we did a piece of research and we found we worked with a forensic accountant, we found out who owned them, you know, and we said, this is what's happening. And they were like, wow, <laughs> like, how do you not know this stuff? Like, this is really fundamental right. stuff. Right. But you, you kind of have to do that legwork. And then by doing that, understanding it, talking to the local agents, seeing how they behave, who are they putting off, why are they putting them off, who are they acting for? Yeah. Then you can kind of go, okay, so now we, now we understand that we're more likely to be able to get that building because it's, a, you know, maybe somebody who wants to sell it or, you know, they, for whatever reason, you might shame them into it. You know, you might campaign around it. You know, that's what worked for Latin Village over time. So you, there's lots of different leverage that you've got to change how your town centre is. But you do have to kind of own it yourself, really, I think now. Because the councils aren't going to do it. They just aren't. They don't think like that. They don't think like, I don't know, detectives. <laughs> it's almost like, you know, it's a bit of Nancy Drew work to go, OK, right, that one. I know, you know, I, I bore myself, like, I'm talking on side street going, so I know who owns that and, like, how many times it's changed hands and who's the shopkeeper. But actually, those things are fundamental if you want to really change how your high street works. I think, and, and you know, and have, have influence who've, over who's in the buildings, and then create the spaces for for new people, and be bolder about. So you're not bold, yeah. uh, but um, but you know, with councils, kind of saying, look, this is the benefit that we're bringing by having that building. This is why we need more from you right now. We're taking a headache off your hands. 
I have an example. Just we had a large, uh, there was a large unit, a 1950s style store. You know, a typical 1950s style store, which mm. shut, mm. and it remained empty for about two years. And somebody wanted to open it as a community hub. Mm. The council had given planning permission, I believe, for it to become flats. Yeah, yeah. So. That's the way they thought. Yeah. Instead of opening it as a community centre. Fortunately, we found somewhere else, but they were going to use this as a community centre in the centre of town, and they've now given planning permission for flats. Yeah. For it. But you've given me plenty of information and ideas, which I might fire at the few officers there, <laughs> as to what are they doing about the people ownership? Because I don't think they know. No, honestly. well, they won't. I they don't won't. think they know. No, and, and you've just made me think... Sorry, I'm going to... Anyway, get sorry, I won't, I won't hog it anymore. Thank but, you. But actually, that happened in, in Tottenham. We had an old co-op. Um, and that closed because the rent was insane. And um, um, Churchill Retirement Homes bought it and wanted to turn it into flats. But at the time that it was for sale, it was for sale for like a year before that. And exactly what you were saying, community hub, market hall, you know, like the old co-op in Dover. And the council actually thought about compulsory purchasing it. And if they had have done it, it would have just been a completely different picture. But now, I mean, it's, it's great, you know, like it's in the centre of town. The people who live there, they're older, you know, they're in the centre. That's great, but... It could have been something so much better, really, with probably a flats above it for, for older people. So I think there's there's the role of, with councils and compulsory purchasing as well, where you can really sort of push them if you've got ideas for things. Sorry. I, 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 this is sort of a very, a very sort of um, specific, specific um, sort of uh, way of... Um, oh, what am I saying? Now I'm saying something. Uh, of, of what is... Of what's going on in my town. But again, our council was pretty good and so it's pretty good but so before the lockdown they uh, started an initiative um to make a culturally diverse um uh, initiative going in, in the tower project and they gave the project to people oh god i hope they're not watching this um <laughs> from bristol <laughs> and and they're now sort of their main headline waving the flag for western and w and they're looking at purchasing a space as well and they're looking going somewhere else, and where it gets tricky is obviously we have got a space as well. But they are at the minute at the minute they are renting our top floor and they are paying the rent. But they are again still looking for another space, and I very doubt it if they'll keep paying the rent for our space, which is just is an old salt rock shop, an old Victorian building, very thin, very small, it's freezing in the winter. Mm. They want to go somewhere nice in the new um, Dolphin Square bid building. Um, so, and it's I, and it's very awkward because we sort of this. They they were set up. The people who run it are a theatre are like a theatre organisation, and they got the sort of the go ahead from the council to make it. And they've been in the town for about we're in North Somerset area for about fifteen years. So a lot of people have got a lot for them to thank them for. And so it does feel sometimes a bit. It feels hard asking them. Oh, but but now we want to have a go. Can you? Yeah, like because they no they they all, they do all live in Bristol, and they just yeah. they're still in the town, and so local people. Us, you know, we, it's very hard to go. Oh, thank you for that opportunity. You've given us a lot, but can we, can we have some of that now to take on that, that lease? It, it's a very awkward conversation I find sometimes, especially being a younger person. Come, and I've got a lot to thank them for. They've paid my rent many a time, but yeah. now it feels very awkward being a local young man and saying, "Oh, actually, can, yeah, can I just do that now?" <laughs> yeah. I, that was a conversation we had in Bradford where there's a, the, the Vintry House that I showed you, there's another arts organisation that kind of is having their rent paid by mm. the council, they're a national portfolio organisation. Yep, same. Yep. And, uh, and so they, um, they, the, the council basically says, well, maybe you can share it, maybe you can share Vintry House. And maybe they can, but also there's a lot of buildings in Bradford. I imagine there's a lot of buildings in Western Superman. In fact, I know there is because I was there in the summer. So, <laughs> like, why are we fighting over the scraps of one building when there's so many more buildings? It's like people have to raise their back. So, you know, the conversation with that organisation, I mean, with the council and that organisation should be, you want to be opening up more spaces in Western for young people yeah. to have spaces to come together and do whatever it is, whether it's sport or arts or, you know, creative stuff. So I think it is about raising our sort of... Um, Horizons, thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Um, did anybody else have anything to share about their... Anything to share with the group? Um, anything to say about their places or their experience? Hey. Yeah. 
Hello, um, I'm from Liverpool, Club Mall, and we've got a small, well, quite a big area in Liverpool that we look after. We've got a small shopping area. <laughs> and one of the problems that hit that shopping area was they moved the bus route. Mm. Whereas the bus used to travel along the little Broadway, as it was, um, and people used to get off one end and wander around the shops and get on the bus the other end and go home. Doesn't happen anymore. Mm. Um, we've tried to fight the move in the bus route. It now goes past an oldie, which was built on the other side of this broad way. Mm. Um, the bus people said, oh, we haven't moved it because of Aldi, but we reckon they did. They absolutely did. And we've lost a lot of shops in that area. Um, mm. A lot because of the footfall and the people couldn't afford the rent. The market closed down because the person who owned it lived in Germany and decided to keep the rent high. It's been t now taken over by a children's play area. Mm. We have um, councillors in our area who are fighting to keep the shopping area going. Mm. We've got an old cinema called the Regal Cinema, which has been closed for a long time. Yeah. Became a bingo hall, closed down. The councillors from the four wards, which are around Club Moor, are trying to get this to open it as a marketplace. Mm. It has been so slow. Yeah. They've been doing this, um, from my knowledge, for about five years now. It started off with the councillors of the local area, spread to the others, and trying to get this building before it decides to fall down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I say, you know, different reasons why high streets don't survive, and ours was because of a bus. So, yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> but there are other, presumably you've looked at other people who've taken on those old sort of buildings, like the old Regals and the... the there's, n there's nothing in there that hasn't been anything in there for a while since the bingo left that, that's been it but a bit like in Plymouth where they've, that's kind of gutted basically yeah. inside and we, we want to try and get you know our, um, my Club Moor we're in a hub but we're right on the edge of Club Moor mm. and we'd love to get into Broadway because it's just, it's the centre of Club Moor really yeah. um, and we said well we would take a space in there and we would utilise if we could get that going Yeah. that would be brilliant yeah yeah so fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, right. That's it. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Safe journey home. <laughs>